oftentimes in life, uh, we think that the end of our life is going to be the easiest part. Uh, we work all our life. We sacrifice. We save money. We have gone through things, difficult things, hard things, and we have overcome them. And we look forward to the end of our life to be that type of life that is simpler, relaxing, and enjoyable. But life is not always like that. Uh, oftentimes, the end of our life is full of testing. Uh, the minute we think that we can enjoy life, we have a health issue, or we lose a loved one, or we have financial trouble, or a big test comes out of nowhere, and it, it just challenges us. Today in our lesson, we're going to meet a man, an old man, who's going to face his most difficult testing period at the age of in the mid-80s. And we're going to see how his faith, how he pulls upon his faith in God, allows him to overcome his greatest trial. Stay tuned. Let's find out a little bit more about Daniel. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, bringing you the Sunday School lesson for this Sunday, February 18th, 2024. I want to thank you for joining me. I want to thank you for all those who have subscribed, all those who view my videos, and my ask that if you could like, share, and subscribe if you have not. Uh, share this video with your friends and families. Uh, I need your help in have having this video reach as many people as possible. So thank you so much in advance. Thank you for joining me on today. The title of our lesson is called Faith in Times of Trouble. Faith in Times of Trouble. We'll look at Daniel chapter 6. We'll cover chapter 3 last week. We'll go to chapter 6 this week. And we'll look at verses 10 through 11. Then we'll look at 16, 17. And then we'll go to 19 through uh, 23, and then we'll go to 26 and 27. But in reality, uh, we'll cover the whole chapter. Uh, you can't not uh, cover the whole chapter. We need that context. We need the detail. It just fills in so many gaps. So we'll cover the whole chapter. We'll do it in a very proficient and beneficial way. So let's get right into this lesson. Um, let's look at some background, what's happening here. If you remember, uh, Daniel and uh, Shirak, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were uh, in southern kingdom, Judah. They were exiled by Babylon. The Babylonian Empire conquered the southern kingdom of Israel, which was Judah, and they remained in exile. They were about 15 or 16 at that time, young men, and uh the test that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through was the fiery furnace. And then so now in chapter 6, we're going to find out Daniel has his uh, great test in the lion's den. But much time has passed by. Uh, as we get to chapter 6, we don't hear anything about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to assume that they have passed, passed, because Daniel's about 85 years old. He's approaching 90 He's lived a long time. Nebuchadnezzar has died. There's been several kings after him. Uh, the king, that the last king of the Babylonian Empire was Belshazzar. That was a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And he is taken off the scene by the king of Persia, Darius. Uh, Belshazzar was pretty much like Nebuchadnezzar in his early days, very puffed up with pride, thought he was invincible and doing a party. The uh, Persian army came and conquered um, Babylon, caught them by surprise, and just destroyed them. And so now we have Daniel being in, uh, in uh, captivity or being exiled under the Persian authority. So that's the transition that we make then. Uh, 
things are changing fast. Uh, Daniel's had the privilege to serve under uh, foreign kings and make tremendous impacts. Uh, he is recognized for his wisdom, his ability to, ter to interpret dreams. He is recognized for his faithfulness to his God. He has an outstanding and blameless reputation known to all. And so let's go to chapter 6. And let's just start reading some of these verses. And for, in verse 1, it said that the first thing that King Darius did was he set up 120 governors to help rule this new empire, this new land, this new conquer nation that he has. And so these governors are assigned different territories within the Babylonian empire. And so over them are three people, and, and Daniel is over uh, Daniel's one of the three that's been chosen. And I say, I think he was chosen. I would assume it doesn't tell us in scripture, but Daniel, his reputation, uh, somebody spoke a good word about him, or maybe he was interviewed and he was impressive, or, or uh, obviously it was God's will that this would happen, but uh, maybe the people saw something in him and somebody put a word and told him about some of the things that he's done. And so he was put in charge. And that would be a good thing to do because he was already in charge so the part of the natural natural step would do is keep him in charge but we know it's God's working and one thing and so so here we have it here then Daniel says um he put them over there so that it would suffer no loss so people would not steal from them uh keep things in order and all those good things there and then it says then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials so those three officials, Daniel's one of three, Daniel distinguished himself among the three through his work ethic, through his attitude, through his spirit, through his service, um, through faithfulness to his God. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And what I want to say is this, we have to understand is that a lot of times we go work for a foreign king, uh, someone who is not of our faith, uh, someone who is really the opposite of who we are, that gives us no excuse not to do a good job uh, at our workplace. Many times at our workplace, we tell people we're a Christian or we put a Bible on the on the table and we 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 show our faith. But here, Daniel demonstrated his faith. In his work ethic, they knew he was devout uh, Jew. They knew he prayed three times a day, but they also knew that he handled his business. And that's how we need to be as Christians on our job. They need to know that we're Christians, and then yet we need to uh, handle our business on the job. I remember a long time ago, I was dealing with uh, someone uh, about an issue, and I walked in there, and I needed her help, and she had a big, thickest Bible on her desk. And when I was talking to her to try to resolve the issue, she was the most ungodly person uh, or misrepresented the Bible more than anybody had ever seen. But yet she had the thick Bible on her desk and uh, eventually she had to be removed from that position. Let that, that be said about us. If we're going to proclaim to be Christians, make sure that our actions are in line with what we profess. And that's where it was with Daniel. So he had, Daniel had God's favor. Uh, he was a great worker, wise, made good decisions. He was loyal. He was faithful. And he set himself apart from the other officials. And the king planned to put Daniel over his kingdom. And so uh, the other thing that we got to remember is as Christians, as we're doing or handling our business, there are going to be some haters. There are going to be some people who are Christians or even are non-Christians going to be jealous of us. And they're going to plot against us. They're going to try to take us down, lie and scheme. And they're going to try to uh, get above you. And that's what's happening here. It says the high, the high officials and the Sandtrap, the, the other the two, and then you had the some of the governors, not all of them, sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel in regard to the kingdom. But Daniel was so good at what he did, they could not find any fault with him. They could not blame anything on him. They could not find an error or fault. And the men said, we cannot find any ground for complaint against Daniel 
unless we find a connection with the law of his God. So now they're going to use his faith against him and make Daniel have to choose between serving uh, the God of Darius or serving Darius and choosing his God. So they're going to try to hit Daniel where it, he knows that he has to make a decision and they know that he's going to choose his God. And when he chooses his God, that's going to disqualify him or get him out of the picture or in this case, cause him to die uh, for not obeying what the king said. So let's look at verse 6. So it says, These high officials and the satraps came by agreement, and the king said to him, O king Darius, live forever. And to the king, and said to him, O king Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, and prefects, and satraps, and counselors, and governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance to enforce an injunction that whoever makes petitions to any god or man for 30 days except you. In other words, they could not worship any god uh, for the next 30 days. They could not use any in intercessor to God except the king himself. And the issue here, if you look at here, he says all the officials, all the governors, all the prefects, all those people. And that's not true. The, earlier, it was just a group of them that got together. But yet, when they go before the king, they make it seem like it's everybody, like it's they and want it. And so we got to be careful as a leader, as people come to you and bring you things. And when they say everybody, that should be a clue to you. Very rare does everybody mean everybody. Everybody sometimes just means they or it's a manipulation to get you to believe that it's everybody. And so as a king, you got to be in tune to who you have around you and what they say to you. Uh, one of the uh, my pet peeves is when people come to me and say they. And one, I think it was E.K. Bailey said that when they come to you and, and they say they, they to they. They're saying what they want to say. And they're blaming it or including everybody else to give more weight and credence to what they're saying. So be careful about that as a leader. And so the law, and so they made this law that for the next 30 days, you only could worship this one God, and you only you could only intercessor you could have was through the king. I Meaning the king had to be the one to pray to that God for you. And it, this law was going to be signed by King Darius. And once it got signed and sealed, it was a done deal. Could not be revoked according to law. So they had, a, they had this scheme. And so this scheme was to trap Daniel and force Daniel to do something he did not want to do, knowing that he wouldn't do it and knowing that would get him in trouble with the king. And so look what happens in 10, starting with our verse. When Daniel knew the document had been signed. So Daniel got wind of this. He knew about this. And what does Daniel do? He said he went to his house where he had windows. He had an upper chamber uh, open toward Jerusalem. So he had a two-story house. He gets on the top where he's quiet and, he, and he's going to pray. And what is he going to pray about? He's going to pray about this decree because he knows that it's in direct conflict with what he, he believes. He knows what he's going to do, but he's asked God to, how to work this situation out. Uh, give him, continue to give him strength to be strong because it, he knows that it's going to cost, it could cost him his life. And so look what it says. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees. Look what he does. He got down on his knees th and three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, his God as he'd done previously. He didn't let this decree stop him from praying to God. He was a devout religious person. He was committed to God. He knew it was at stake, and yet he continued to pray. Uh, and I like that about him. Uh, uh, and he's going to let God fight his battle, but he knows that, hey, I serve this one God, and I pray him. I pray three times a day, and I'm going to continue to do that. That's his faithfulness and loyalty to God on display. I like that. It said, then these men came by agreement, these men, these people that conspired, these few handful of men. And that's all it takes is a handful of people to cause chaos in ministry, in a kingdom, or in any situation. It doesn't take a mob. It just takes a couple of uh, manipulators. And so these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plead before his God. 
They knew what time of day that he did it. They knew when he was going to do it. Uh, Daniel did it in the open for for the uh, for people to see. I like about that because a lot of times Christians we believe that our our religion, our faith, is is a private matter. It is a private matter, but it's also a pub public matter. It's a private and public matter. You pray to God in private, or you have a one-on-one -on -one time with God, but also in your walk, um, in your communication, how you conduct yourself, you talk about the God you serve. You let people know that you serve the God, the one true living God. You don't hide it, and Daniel did not hide it. He had a private relationship, but his relationship with God was also for people to see. And so these people knew that. So they, they, they set them up and they see them praying and they go back and tell the king. He said, did you not sign an injunction that anyone makes a petition that oh, they can't uh, worship anybody but this guy? They had to go through you. And it says, there's a man named Daniel who's one of the exiles. So they also were upset with Daniel being over them or, or the king planning to put Daniel over them. One, because he was a Jew, and two, because they wanted to be in that position. So they were the prejudiced or racist against Daniel for being a Jew, and they're also upset about Daniel being placed over them when probably they had been serving the king obviously much longer than Daniel has. Daniel's the newcomer, and they did not want to be subjected to Daniel. And so I remind the king, king heard these words and was much distressed, and set his mind to deliver Daniel. So look what happens here, verse 14. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed. Why was he distressed? He said he set his mind to deliver Daniel. Because now he knew he had been tricked. He had been conned by these men. They had got him to sign this document. This document was irrevocable. And they knew that he had to put Daniel to death. And it distressed him because he liked Daniel. He admired Daniel. He, uh, he knew Daniel was trustworthy. So much so, he was going to make him over his kingdom second in command. And so it distressed him because he had got hook-winged by these people here. And so he labored till sun went down to rescue him. He went to the law books. And that day and time there, that uh, when there was a judgment, it had to be carried out the same day especially a death judgment. And so he searched, and, and when they found uh, Daniel, it was in the afternoon, so he had till that evening to do something. So he searched the, the law books, the law books, and could not find an escape clause or anything like that, so he knew he had to put him to death. He says, look what he says here. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said, O oh, now, O king, that is the law on the Mede and the Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that the king established can be changed. They remind the king of the law. And the king should be furious with them. I know I will be hot. These men looking in your face that you're supposed to trust just conned you and tricked you and manipulated you, and you trust them. And what you also got to remember, that one of the ways that the enemy can get to you is by getting to your ego or your vanity. See, the, uh, the King Darius, when they said that um, can't worship this God and can't nobody go through uh, uh, no man except through you, they were appealing to his ego. They were exalting him, and he fed right into it. So sometimes when people come and they flatter you and they try to prop you up, or oh, you're so great and you're so this, you know, you handle it with a grain of salt. Don't let don't be manipulated by that. Don't be set up by that. And you would avoid situations like this. Costly mistakes. Bad mistakes. Okay? It says right here, Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. And the king declared to Daniel. Look what he says here. This is how Daniel's his walk looked before the king. May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. He knew about the past, Daniel's past, and what Daniel's God has done. Maybe Daniel told him, maybe he heard it, but he was aware. He said, may the God whom you serve continually. He knew Daniel was faithfully, faithful, and he knew that he was devout in his uh, faithfulness to God. And he said, may this God deliver you. And he's really saying, may this God deliver you like he's done in the past, like he's protected you in the past, like all those things he's done for you, your God is able. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. 
and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, nothing might be changed concerning it. So uh, he put it, they had to put the seal of approval on it where nothing could be changed. This was irrevocable. Daniel was going to be thrown into the lion's den. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. And no diversions were brought to him, and he and slept, fled for him. He stayed up all night, fasted, worried to death about Daniel. He cared for Daniel. Daniel was he liked Daniel. He was fond of Daniel. That's amazing. Okay. Then at the day at the break of day, the king arose and went into haste to the den of lions. That was part of the law. They can come and see at daybreak uh, what was left. Of the person, if the person survived the torture, he was to be let free. If he did not, then that's what happened. As he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, Daniel, O servant of live the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Now, this lets us know that Darius was not saved, but he had the utmost respect of Daniel's um, God, living God, and also, you got to remember, I said last week, they were polytheistic. So, uh, Darius probably incorporated Daniel's God into his group of gods. So, but he was not saved. He just uh, had utmost respect, and, um, and that was that. Okay, so he calls out to Daniel. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel. Uh, many people believe that was the angel of the Lord, meaning Jesus Christ himself, and shut the lion's mouth, and they have that harmony because I was found blameless before God and also before you. God saw no fault in him, and you see no fault, and I am also blameless in front of you. I did not do what, what they're trying to say I did. I've been faithful to you. Then the king um, uh, it says, also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that David be taken up out of the den. So uh, Daniel was dropped into the den like a pit, and they pulled him up. And nothing was done to him. He was not harmed, not a scratch, not anything. Uh, Jesus was with him the whole time he was in that lion's den and we that tells us too that when we go through our most difficult trials or any trial jesus christ if you're a child of god guess what he is there with us just like uh shadrach meshach and abednego was in that fiery den and nebuchadnezzar saw that fourth person yet he was with them he was with daniel and even though we can't see him whatever trial that we're going with he's with us the holy spirit's with us we are not alone god is with us okay all right. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. Uh, no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. How do we get through a fiery trial? How do we get through? How do we get through times where we're in trouble? We're in a lion's den. Guess what? We trust God. Whatever you're going through, and many people are going through a lot of things. Trust God. Be be faithful. Know the scriptures. Know what God can do. Know that he's with you. Know that he knows the circumstance better than you do. Trust God. And that's what that's how Daniel got through. That was the key to his salvation. That's the key to our salvation. And the king commanded, and these men, then the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously, meaning falsely accused Daniel, were brought and cast into the den of lions. And that custom there, when you falsely accuse somebody, the judgment that was supposed to happen on that person that you falsely accused was now going to happen on the people who falsely accused that person, that innocent person. So now they were to throw Daniel in the lion's den. And because they falsely accused uh, Daniel, set him up, lied and all that, conspired and all that, they were now going to be thrown into the lion's den. Now the part that really upset me a lot was not only were these men thrown into the lion's den, I can see that, but the wives and children of these men were thrown into the lion's den. That reminds me of Joshua and Achan when Achan was stoned. Not only was he stoned, his entire family was stoned. And so uh, here uh, we have the, the wives and children who probably knew nothing about this 
being punished also. And the thought was probably you didn't want them to grow up or to have some kind of retaliation against the king or plot to kill the king or the father was seen as a representative of the family. And so whatever, if he got blessed, they got blessed. If he got cursed, they got cursed. So it could have been one of those two reasons or both. It says, it says, and they, and they, their children and their wives thrown into the lion's den. And before they reached the bottom of the den, it was dropping them down. The lions overpowered them, broke all their bones into pieces. Wow. Amazing. That bothered me. But that bothered me. But um, that's what happens. That's what happens. You don't always get to choose your consequences. Your consequences are all, don't always just affect you. They affect other people. That's just the way the harsh reality of life is at times. So we have to be careful about what we do. But here we have here. Look what happens here. Then King Darius, King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages, all the peoples in power. He said on a decree that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people ought to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Okay. Darius saw the God of Daniel at work makes the decree that we ought to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Respect the God of Daniel. Respect the God of the Jews. It says, for he is the living God. I like that word, living God. He's not an idol. He's not a God of no action. He's not a dead God. But this is a living God, one who takes action, the one who intercedes, the one who delivers, enduring forever, Everlasting, no beginning, no end. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. See, I believe this is God speaking through him. And just like Nebuchadnezzar lifted up the, at the end of his, his, toward the end of his reign, he praised God, lifted up God, glorified his name. Now King Darius is doing the same. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall never be to the end. How true is that? He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and earth. And he who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. That was an awesome miracle that God did. One that could not be denied. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So he, he reigned. He reigned. God blessed him. What do we learn from Daniel in the lion's den? I like the fact that he trusted a living God. A living God, the one and only God, the most high God. He trusted him. And one thing I like about it is that um, if whether or not God threw him in there or not, uh, he still trusts whether, whether he survived or not, God still trusted him. I mean, Daniel still trusted God. He didn't know, he, he didn't know for sure whether he was going to survive or not. He didn't know for sure whether or not he was going to be delivered or not, but he knew that God was going to take care of him. And we have to understand that sometimes we don't know how God's going to work it out. Our job is to trust him and trust him completely. And when we trust him, we can't help but win with God. Does it mean that we're going to not have that situation anymore? No, but it means that we're going to be empowered to deal with it by trusting God. When we times we feel depressed and low by trusting God, God gives us joy in the midst of our hardships. And I like Daniel, his faithfulness to God. He, he was going to praise God no matter what. He was not let the world uh, keep him from doing praising God. A lot of times we don't want to tell people we go to church. A lot of times we don't want to tell people we're Christians. A lot of times we are scared to say grace in front of people, our co-workers, because we don't want to seem too religious. But that's not Daniel. Put God first in your life. Let God be number one and let people see it. You don't brag about it. Uh, you know, a lot of people, I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of people are able to quote verses left and right, but can they, do their actions reflect what they believe? In Daniel's case, I believe his actions spoke louder, louder than words. His actions showed what type of God he served in the workplace, how he treated people, in his attitude, in his demeanor. His attitude uh, uh, went before him. His work ethic went before him. And, that, and through that, people saw the God that he served. 
And that's the way it should be with us. They should see the God that we serve through our actions, on our job. Not because we have a big Bible on the, on the table. Not because we can uh, quote a lot of verses. I know a lot of people that quote a lot of verses that don't even follow God. And I'm going to say this lastly. In your workplace, serve whoever you're under. Be ethical. Be honest. But give them your very best. Let them see God through you. A lot of people say, you know, if, I'm a, if you're appointed to work in somebody's administration and they're a heathen, serve that heathen in a godly way. Look what's happening here. These people are responding. Nebuchadnezzar, Darius are responding to Daniel and his God. You never know how you can lead that person to Christ. Anyway, we've had a great lesson. I love Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel is a blameless man, honorable man, trustworthy man. He is a man worth following, worth imitating in the workplace, in our serving, in hard times. He was thrown, he prospered. God had his hand on him. So I hope this lesson helped you in some kind of way. I um, hope that uh, if you're a student, it's helped you. If you're a teacher, it's helped you in some kind of way. Um, I hope it's been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to me. Thank you for joining me again. We'll talk again next week. God bless you.